It was in 2014, our then mayor, Kevin Johnson, had established a committee of community leaders, healthcare professionals, others, and he had two seats at the table for clergy members. I learned of that and got invited to be one of the two clergy members. The other was Sherwood Carthen. He was serving with me. He was just a beautiful friend. And he passed away, actually, not long after we served together on this committee. We had been together in a meeting in this church. And then just days after, my brother, Pastor Carthen, had a heart attack and went to heaven. I miss him a lot. I think of him even coming back to this experience of serving in homeless concerns for our community. Since then, the homeless issues have only worsened and many reasons for that for sure. The seasons that we've been through have elevated the lack of, of income for people and housing. So we're seeing it in just an amazing display on our streets today and it's concerning. So this issue of homelessness is only getting more difficult. And yet what I found happened in my life was instead of having a feeling of disdain for people that were in a difficult place, how God opened up my heart to care about them. As part of the message, I would pray that we could all receive today and going forward is how we view people that are in difficult situations. As we were working with the mayor in this committee, we had established a winter sanctuary where we gathered 30 churches together. It all came through our efforts with our team, and we contacted other churches in the community. 30 churches were serving from Thanksgiving to March. We did this for two or three years running, where the homeless people would gather downtown and be bused to churches each night, and a church would take maybe a week at a time. We would do that. Many of you served there. In the evenings, we would provide food. The church provided the food for free, not a cost to the city. And we would serve those that would come and have spaces for them to lay down sleeping bags and have a, a nice place, a quiet place, and a sheltered place to sleep at night. And then breakfast in the morning, and they would bus back downtown. The daytimes, they could navigate fine. But each night during the winter season, when it gets rainy, cold, there would be a place for many to come. We had done this for you know, two, three years when the city's funding for the infrastructure, the buses cost some to operate, some security that have to be on point every day. And that infrastructure, the money had dried up at the city. So Mayor Johnson asked me again, is there anything that you could do? You have any ideas? How can we raise some funds so we don't have to stop this program? I came back to our team here at the church and met with our staff, and we started dialoguing around that. Is there any ideas that we could come up with? Right before that meeting, I had had a thought come into my mind. What if I went and lived on the street among the homeless, and as an awareness, we could do a social media campaign to see if people would contribute to get the preacher off the street was kind of the idea. I'd only shared it with my wife, and she actually resonated with the idea. I was somewhat surprised, but it seemed like in her spirit, she felt like it could be a, a provision from God. And then when I met with our team, I didn't share that idea. And one of our team members put that on the table. And I thought, well, that for me was confirmation. This must be something we're feeling, feeling led to do. So two weeks after that meeting, we launched because when you go homeless, you don't plan. You just end up there. And we didn't do a lot of planning. I took money that I had in my wallet on a Sunday. I preached on a Sunday, went back to my office, picked up a backpack, a sleeping bag, left my keys, left my wallet, took my ID and my cell phone. Homeless people have cell phones. I did discover that. At the time, they called them Obama phones because they were government provided. And so that felt like I wasn't cheating the system to do that. And I didn't know what I had in my wallet. I just took what I had and it happened to be $60 and ended up going, walking across the, the overpass on Mayhew to the light rail, 
got on light rail and ended up downtown and stayed there for two weeks until taking it back, ending up here at church on a Sunday morning to share my story. That two-week period was life-transforming, and that's what this story emanates from. There are many other tangents that, that come, it's in the book that goes into many other issues that relate to what was learned in this experience of living among our city. I want to read just a little excerpt from one of the chapters in the book to get us started. I'd been on the streets a few days when I met with a few friends from church. Someone in that conversation used the term incarnate. What do you mean, I asked. You put yourself in others' shoes, he said. It was a turning point for me. It's where I began thinking about Jesus and the homeless and all kinds of broken people in a whole new way. I began seeing John 1 and Hebrews 4 differently because I started seeing what God did for me in a different way. Incarnation isn't just a fancy theological term for me anymore. I had learned that word incarnation. Jesus became incarnate becoming God, as God, becoming man, and taking on our form that was the original incarnation. Jesus incarnated. He came into my world. He pulled on my shoes. He experienced life like I do, all of it, the hurts, the pains, the sorrows. If anybody understands what you're going through, Jesus does. Jesus knows where we're weak, but he doesn't condemn us for that. His grace covers us. He came to shelter us. He came to love us, not to put us under pressure, not to cause us trouble. He came to resolve our troubles. He came to take the pain, all that we would ever have, on himself. He came to take our place. He says, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be well. We first read of the incarnation in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. This is speaking of Jesus. He is the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Then to verse 14, and the word became flesh, Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The incarnation shows us the perfection of God's love. The word that is the title for today's talk is perfection. Jesus, the incarnation shows us the perfection of God's love. There's nothing ever been like it or will be when God himself comes and takes on our form and he's perfect. The incarnation that he provided for us is the picture of perfection. John 3, verse 16, and then verse 17 that follows describes so well his heart in the incarnation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Talk about perfection. Jesus comes into our world in our form to set us free, seeing our brokenness, seeing that we were messed up and had no way of fixing ourselves. He came into our form and said, I'm going to figure this out for you. He lived perfectly in our form, though he was tempted in all points like we are. He could have fallen, yet he did not. He lived perfectly and he became the perfect sacrifice that we deserve to pay. He took it upon himself and he did not come to condemn us. We were condemned already by the evil one, by the devil, 
and Jesus rescues us from condemnation. If you live with the spirit of condemnation at all today, and it's possible, like, we know our brokenness, we know where we fall short, and sometimes we can't get the enemy's voice out of our head of how awful we are and how condemned we are. We often condemn ourselves, but Jesus doesn't. He did not come to condemn you, but to save you. The incarnation is perfection. What Jesus did is perfect, and when I accept him as my provision, I am no longer condemned by the devil. He can't condemn me anymore because I now belong to Jesus, and the light dispels the darkness. It's a beautiful truth. The incarnation shows us the perfection of Jesus' understanding of our hurt, of our struggles, of our temptations. I mentioned Hebrews 4. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's calling us to come near to him, the the throne of grace, the place where there's mercy. We don't come near to Jesus and he goes, oh, you are a mess, get away from me. We come near to Jesus and he's like, oh, you're in the right place. Let me wrap my arms of love around you. There's mercy here, there's grace here. He's full of grace and truth and he then enables us to help others in their time of need. The incarnation provides a perfect sacrifice for our eternal freedom. Jesus did not deserve death, but he died. He did it willingly. The perfect one became the perfect sacrifice. We deserve punishment, but we receive forgiveness. This is the glory of the message of good news that Jesus has for us. The incarnation is a message of perfection and that when we receive his grace, what he's come to give, That perfection invades our life, and he now sees us like he is, perfect as he is. This is the glory of the message that he puts in our heart. My homeless experience caused me to see people who had been invisible to me for 20 years up until the time I walked into that situation. Let me read just another excerpt from the book. I couldn't remember a single soul from those two decades. They were not on my radar, the homeless. I had something else to do. They were not my concern. Basically, they were not people to me. I had my latte and my ministry appointments. Or if I noticed them at all, it was they can't be helped. They're mentally ill. They want to be out here. They don't want a place to stay. Or, what can you do? It's drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes and criminals. They made their bed, let them lie in it. It's their problem. Or, all those people living off my taxes. Why don't they get a job? What's wrong with them? Until now, for a few extraordinary days, I saw them. I was with them. They became human beings. It wasn't about the concept of homelessness. It was about people. The people Jesus came for, the people his incarnation was for. I didn't expect what happened to me to happen. I was trying to raise money to keep a program going, and we succeeded at that. But in the process, I started having my heart broken for these broken people. I started seeing people that I had dismissed as irrelevant, sitting with them, looking in their eyes, and even though at times it seemed like empty shells, you could still see value there. There was this change that happened to me I didn't expect. I wasn't looking for it, I wasn't asking for it, it just started happening. And I'm praying that I don't lose it. Thus, the reason why about three or four years after this experience, 
I chose to take another week and without any project in mind and without any announcement, just I'm going to go do this for a week. And a couple of years ago, I revisited the streets for a week from a Sunday to a Sunday. I didn't want to lose what I felt like God had been speaking to me about, and it's so easy to get away from that, to get out of that environment, to start seeing the problem escalate like it is right now, and to get disgusted and to begin to not care and to begin to wish that this problem would just go away. I started having thoughts and got concerned about myself. Why am I starting to think this way again? I'm falling into a pattern and I went for another week. I don't know if I'll do it again. My mom called me the other day. She had read the book and just had finished it, and she was complimenting me for that. But then she said, I sure hope you don't go and do that again. I'm like, I get it, Mom. It's my mom. I'm a 63-year-old baby to my mom, like it's always going to be, right? I appreciated that. Yet I don't know that I won't do it again because it depends. If I find myself start feeling calloused and uncaring, it might be something that I, I it's no, nobody else, I'm not saying that no one else needs to do that. You don't need to do that. Read the book and learn the lesson that maybe I can share from my heart with you. Speaking of taxes, in our reading of the Gospel of Matthew, we continue from where we left off last week. We find ourselves at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, when you read Mark's account of the same story, he, he explains the same thing. He expands a little bit and said there was a whole bunch of tax collectors there and others, and they were having dinner at Matthew's house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This experience is quite compelling. Why are there stories in the Bible like this? People that are messed up, people that are broken, and Jesus comes and helps them, gives them a future, changes their life. The purpose of these stories is not to tell us what Jesus did. This is a fact. This is a part of history, and it's good to know what he did. The purpose is to tell us what Jesus does. This is who he is. This isn't like, well, that was nice. This is like, this is the way life is now. This is what Jesus does today. He's not doing it just for them. He's doing it for me. He's doing it for you. When I read these stories of what Jesus did, it's like life-giving, because it's like, you would do that for me if I'm that guy? You'd sit me with me too? Thank you, Jesus. This is what he does. He's defining himself and the perfection of his incarnation. Who were these tax collectors? A brief study of the day reveals to us that the tax collectors were Jews and these Jewish tax collectors were not well respected in the land. In fact, there were Jews that des despised the Jewish tax collectors. They worked in collaboration with the Roman government that ruled over them. Tax collectors paid the authorities for the privilege of collecting taxes. Then they overcharged people, skimming off the top to line their own pockets. There was no technology in that day. They had to collect it you know, face to face. And 
telling people how much they owed. How do people supposed to know? These tax collectors were criminal. They were thieves. And this was their reputation. This is what they were known for. There are many people with whom most Christians today would not eat. And the Pharisees identify these tax collectors as that kind. What are you doing, Jesus, eating with those people? Like That was like really despised by the people of the day. Tax collectors and sinners. So the sinners group could be whatever. I mean, lump it all in there. Who do we decide we don't want to be around? If we're not careful, we develop the attitude of the Pharisee instead of the attitude of the incarnate one who is perfection, who in his perfection is not afraid of anybody, but says, I'm here to help you. And he sits down with the broken so that he can help them find a place of freedom. What is it in our world? Who do we not want to sit down with? The homeless? Do we not want to sit down with the LGBTQ people? They're precious souls that Jesus loves. And if we just decide we're going to get categories going and lump people into sinning categories, where do you stop? In this house right now, what what kind of mess did we bring in ourselves today? How, How much other aberrant behaviors are represented in our in in this room? We've got some favorite ones that we pick out, say this is what's wrecking our world today. When there's the evil one and there's evil for sure, but the people who are bearing the brunt of the evil attack are very precious to Jesus and he would sit down with them. When we have relationships with people of other faith groups, I have a Jewish rabbi friend. I have a Muslim imam friend. I've been to a Ramadan event. And, man, that's risky because religious people go, what are you doing eating with them? And I suddenly feel like I'm in good company because Jesus is the perfection of incarnation who we're not there to let Someone else's ways rub off on us. We're there to say they matter, they're important, and let's see if we can't let the love of Jesus flow through us to the world around us. Looking at people the way Jesus does is a radically different way of looking at people. It's looking at people with God's mercy. Verse 13 in Matthew 9, Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So Jesus quotes an Old Testament passage to the Pharisees. The Pharisees know the law. They know the Old Testament. That's what they do every day. They're steeped in it. And Jesus says to them a statement that's written in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. Go away and think about this. What does this mean? I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Well, he's quoting an experience that they knew about. I had to go look that up, and it's one of the more amazing stories in the whole Bible. Hosea is a prophet, a minister of God, and God asked Hosea to marry a prostitute. Her name is Gomer, and he does. He follows the direction of God's word to him. And after the marriage, and they are in a covenant relationship of marriage, Gomer keeps going back to her old way, her old life. And she's unfaithful to Hosea time after time. And God keeps telling Hosea to take her back. Take her back again. Take her back again. God's mercy embraces sinful people. And now, in this experience that God is describing out of Hosea, he is likening Hosea and Gomer's relationship and why he's asking 
Hosea to keep taking her back to the Israelites who had had a covenant relationship with God and followed him, but then didn't. They got messed up in their thinking and they created other idols and worshiped other gods and their lifestyle got very sideways. And then after a time, they would realize it and they would repent and they would come back to God. And what would God do? He would take them back. And then they would go down another aberrant path and what would God do? He would take them back again. And God is revealing to us what he's like, how we're broken people and Jesus, the incarnate one, is perfection and what does he do? He comes among the broken and now he's calling us to do the same, to find people that are maybe not in the right place. Maybe their lifestyle's a pretty big fat mess. Maybe it doesn't agree, the scripture doesn't agree with what people are doing. Like, we, we, uh, <laughs> we lived a life of perfection according to the scriptures. Like, it calls us all out. But then shows us the way is that Jesus is the way. His perfection covers all of us. And when that happens, we can stay united with him. He keeps calling us of how to grow, how to overcome the temptations that come our way but he's calling us to look at people that are broken differently, not condemningly, not judgmentally. That's usually where we go. Hosea chapter three, verse one, I'll wrap up. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without a king or priest, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. God will always take us back. What did Hosea do? He actually purchased Gomer back. He paid what needed to be paid. What did Jesus do for us? He redeemed us. He paid for us the price that needed to be paid. It was his death. It was his blood shed on the cross. Jesus came and in his perfection said, let me buy you back. Hosea bought Gomer back, paid for her, and now says, please stay. Don't go back to your old ways. I've purchased your redemption. You don't need to earn money from that behavior any longer. I've got you covered. I have you covered forever. Just stay with me now. And God is saying to you and to me, I've got you covered. I've paid the price for you. You don't have to go back. You don't have to do this anymore. You don't need to go into that path. I've got you covered. We should never forget this is a picture of God's love for us. I'm Gomer. You are. Gomer. There's a lot more Gomers in the world. What do we do? Go have dinner with them. Go sit with them. Go talk to them. Go let them know that there's a price that's been paid. It's already covered. They didn't have to continue in their broken state. The transformation God wants for me is not just for me to be saved. It's also a transformation in how I interact with others. I want to be free from my prison of negativity. Today, there's so much noise. This world is a big fat mess. It is. And it's getting harder, it feels like, to figure out how to navigate, even on a spiritual front. Yet, I want to not be a part of a church that approaches the brokenness of this world with pure negativity, but rather, the incarnation of Jesus is perfection. I want to strive for the perfection he displayed when he said, I'm here for you. We can speak about what's wrong 
as far as sin goes, but the people we need to love on. When we start confusing the message of what's wrong in the world, that it's the people that are the wrong thing in the world, we've confused the message. The idea of hating the sin and loving the sinner sounds nice. It's just really hard to separate the two. We don't know how to do that. When we start hating the sin, we tend to lump that on the sinner. We don't know how to keep that separate. God does, and he wants to help us learn it. He wants to help us figure out how we hate the sin that does destroy, but that we're not putting that on the sinner like they're the problem. They have a problem, but we love them. And so we're gonna go and sit with tax collectors and sinners, with homeless people, with gay people, with Muslim people, with people of other persuasions. We're gonna go sit with people and say, how can I help you? And when there are broken people, we don't want a caste system. Now there's a great backlash that's coming in this season that we're in because there's such great racial unrest. Now it's the critical race theory that is the problem that we need to make sure we don't go there. And it's a big backlash against trying to care for people that have been oppressed for many, many years. We need to be careful. We don't even understand what that term means. All I wanna do is say, God, I wanna follow you. I wanna be Jesus. I wanna sit with people that are broken. I wanna care for people that have been oppressed and where there is systemic problems, I wanna figure out how to fix that. What can we do to change the world by loving on people and setting the captive free? God wants to show us how to do that. There's perfection in the incarnation. So God, I pray you help us to figure out you and receive your love that's amazing. Wash over us and cleanse us. If you need his grace today, just pray with me. Jesus, I believe in you. I know I've sinned, I need your help. Cover me today with your grace, with your mercy. I wanna follow you, I accept your offer of forgiveness. Thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen.